Hello and welcome to New Starting in Land Ministries. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I actually wanted to come on and share a testimony with you all, something that the Lord showed me um, pertaining to country living, getting out of the cities, and a little bit of history that I found. But um, basically it came from a testimony. We um, obtained a country property and on that country property we had to look for the septic tank. So the professional came out and dug the trench and as if the house was there because the house was burned down, um, he had to dig the trench where the house would have been and then went in the middle to dig for the pipe. So he followed the pipe out to the septic and praise the Lord, it was found. So lo and behold, I'm just sitting there saying, Lord, please help me to find a spiritual lesson out of this situation. So I'm just praying and then the Lord showed me and he sent me to the scripture and that you're probably familiar with in the book of Luke chapter 19 verse 41 through 44. So the Lord took me there and it was truly a rich blessing and I was so blown away at what the Lord was showing me and I wanted to share it with you all. So I hope that it's a rich blessing and I'll try to keep this real short so that you can understand. Well, like I said, the Lord took me to those scriptures and I'm going to read it. So if you have your Bibles or if you would like to listen, we're going to read from the book of Luke chapter 19, verse 41 through 44. And it reads, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side. And shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So when I read that, I said, okay, Lord, you know, I wanted to learn a spiritual lesson about the trench, right? So the Lord is telling me, he says, I tell you when it comes to pass, so that when it comes to pass, that you might believe. Believe in what? Believe in the gospel. So I said, okay, Lord. So, you know, the bottom line of the, the main theme of this was, after we dug the trench, you know, we went into the ghetto because I had to take my husband somewhere and it was having to be in the ghetto. So my husband met, mentioned he's like, you know, we're in the ghetto. He was telling me places not to go where it wouldn't be safe. So I was like, okay. So in my head I said, where did that term come from? Like the ghetto, you know, what's the history behind that? Well, there is a great history behind that and I did some research and actually the ghetto it comes from the Jews and the Nazis. Back in the day, they actually had, the Jews actually lived in quote on ghetto. It was highly diseased, highly populated, and it was just a lot of people just cluttered in one place. It was not a good place to be. And they were kept in one spot. They were stuck together. Um, it was not a good place. And they were like basically almost starved to death. And they, it was a city. So this happened in uh, Luke 19, 41 through 44. This happened in the 1600s. And it made me think like, wow, this kind of happened during COVID time. You know, when a lot of people were shutting their house, people were rushing into food banks, no one could come outside. And there's an article I'm going to put in the description box that talks about, you know, in the ghettos, it was just like that. It was, you know, the same thing. They were diseased, it was highly populated, and they were shutting the place down. And that made me realize something, just thinking about all that and how the Lord put it all together. I said, Lord, you know, we really need to get out of the cities. Help us, help us as a people to get out of the city. I used to live in the city. Me, I don't live in the city, I live in the country. But I say us because I'm talking to my people, you know. I'm talking to y'all and I want y'all to leave those places because I believe that God has a better place and environment with pure air, fresh water, a better way of living because the conveniences in the city only um, sometimes it actually 
cripple some people, you know, to to depend on something versus just using their minds in time. And most of the time, God just wants to commune with us and let, let aside the distractions that come with the cities and those things that are in there. But if we just listen to God's voice, to me, I know and I see, based off of God's word, Adam and Eve commune with God while they were in the midst of the garden. They walked with him. God wants to do the same thing in nature today. And yet, you know, they may have nature parks in the city, but there's still a lot of distractions there. So think about that. And also think about, you know, the scripture, Luke 19, verse 41 through 44. Think about what happened in the 1600s and think about what happened in COVID. How many, the whole United States was just stuck in the house. Those who lived in the country, at least they had the opportunity to go outside, walk around on their property, uh, what have you. And you're like, well, yeah, you, you have a country property or some people have a country property. Yeah, they have money, they have this. No, God can provide. He can provide. He can give you a bunch of property. He can give you everything. He said, and this is the confidence that I have in him, that if you ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. God will answer. He will answer according to his will. He hears his prayer, but it has to be according to his will. So God can provide that country property. He can provide anything, but we just have to believe. God wants us to come out of the city. He wants you to come out of the city. He wanted me to come out of the city. I happen to take heed, but he wants you to take heed too. And he wants you to follow his voice. He is weeping in heaven for us. He is weeping over the cities. Think about Abraham and Lot. Abraham chose the countryside. Lot went into the city. But what happened when Lot left the city? The city was destroyed. That's the word of God. History loves to repeat itself. And what happened during COVID happened in 1600. What happened in 1600 happened in Luke 19, 41 through 44. And once again, God tells us when it comes to pass, I tell you before it comes to pass so that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Believe in Jesus. Take hold of him. And remember that God loves you so much. So, like I said, there's a video at the end of, the, of this video, so I want you to watch that video and see and think about where you are right now. If you're in the country, praise the Lord. Think about how you can help someone else come out of the city or how you can vamp up, how you can preserve a little more for yourself and maybe somebody else. If you're in the city, think about, okay, let me think. Does God... If something was to go down, what's going to happen with me and my family? If something was to go down, how hard it would be to shut things down for me to be stuck here? We got to think about that because history repeats itself. But enjoy the video. Please watch it. Take your time. Meditate on where you are currently. This can apply to everyone. If you're out of the city, weep over those who are in the city. But that's what Jesus did. Love you all and God be with you. In September 1939, the Germans invaded Poland and World War II began. Jews were immediately targeted and subjected to violence and humiliation by German soldiers. Guided by racial and anti-Semitic ideology and striving to establish a new order in Europe, the Germans separated the Jews from the population by establishing ghettos. The ghettos were usually in a poor neighborhood. Jewish families who had lived in their homes for decades had to find shelter in extremely crowded areas in which they were forced to live behind walls, fences, or barbed wire. Isolated and cut off from their livelihoods, the Jews suffered greatly from starvation, from disease, and from impoverishment. The establishment of ghettos in Eastern Europe was an uneven process that began in the autumn of 1939 and continued well into 1941. It's important to emphasize that the ghettos were established as an interim measure 
as the Germans continued to seek a solution to what they defined as the Jewish problem. At no point were the Germans interested in creating some sort of continuity for Jewish life. It was uh, the beginning of the end of survival, of, of, of becoming a different, uh, uh, a different existence, totally a different uh, human being, uh, another, another world. That world was just fast and faster disappearing. Ellis Lewin was born in Lodz. He was eight years old when the Germans established a ghetto in his city. He, his father Joseph, his mother Hannah, and his sister Miriam were incarcerated in the ghetto for four long years. I was constantly kept inside. I was, was not to go out. So I was like inside forever. And we started living inside. When any playing we did as children, we did inside. There was no, no outside anymore. It was no longer next week or uh, 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 what should we have done a year ago. Now we're confronted with a um, with the devil himself, and uh, uh, we were instantly cut off from everything. And uh, the uh, the uh, instant uh, brutality, the instant uh, uh, orders, the instant uh, change, uh, it was not a a, a slower a way of of introducing you into, into that kind of a existence. It was like the door shutting on you, and that's it. Ellis talks about the constant and immediate drastic change that happened once he was incarcerated in the ghetto. But it was not only one immediate change, it was an ongoing process of changes that influenced every aspect of life. Even his concept of time changed and the future was reduced to the next hour, the next day. The challenges of teaching this period are great. How can we make the story of the ghettos relevant to our students today? How can we trace today, decades after these horrifying events happened, what Jews felt, understood, and knew when the events were actually taking place? We will journey back in time using diaries, poems, testimonies, and other primary sources that will shed some light on the struggle for life during the long, dark days of the ghettos. In order to better understand the story of the ghettos, we have chosen to focus on the Lodz ghetto. The Lodz ghetto was one of the first to be established in April of 1940. It was the second largest ghetto to be established, and it was completely sealed off from the outside world. The area of the ghetto was about one and a half square miles. 170,000 Jews were incarcerated in it, which meant that there was between eight and 10 people per room. The houses were so deteriorated that many of them were not connected to sewage, to gas, or to water. David Shirakoviak was born in Lodz in 1924. He began to keep a diary from the summer of 1939, the outbreak of the war, until shortly before he died in the summer of 1943 out of hunger and exhaustion. Wednesday, October 4th, 1939. Some student from the German school ran up to me with a big stick in his hand and shouted, Come work! You can't go to school! I did not resist because I knew that no papers could help me here. He took me to a square where over a dozen Jews were already at work picking up leaves. Through no fault of his own, David, who until recently lived a normal life, is at once thrown into a situation where he is completely humiliated. Yet he rises above this difficult moment and looks into the deeper meaning of human behavior and writes, it's our oppressors that should be ashamed, not us. A diary is like a photograph. It captures a moment, enabling us to understand how people felt and experienced the events as they were happening. And unlike memoirs, it's not influenced by time or future perspectives. It's important to realize that a diarist writes his feelings for himself alone. It's not a historical document. Therefore, when reading a diary written by somebody who was murdered in the Holocaust, we should be respectful of his dignity. 
You have to remember we are entering the intimacy of his soul. Friday, May 2nd, 1941. The portion of bread I receive won't feed me for more than two or three days. After that, my stomach's empty, and all I can think of is the next loaf of bread. The overcrowding, hunger, and loss had become an inseparable part of life in the ghetto, turning every day into a struggle for one's physical and spiritual existence. Sunday, May 11th, 1941. I feel awful and look worse and worse. I hear that it's hard to recognize me. More than 43,000 Jews, 21% of the ghetto inhabitants, died due to the harsh conditions. Friday, May 16th, 1941. I have been examined by a doctor at school. She was terrified at how thin I am. The checkup has left me frightened and worried. David reveals the constant fragmenting of normalcy, but he also reveals the choices he made and the lifelines he was holding on to. From the beginning of the German occupation, he mentions school. Sunday, April 27th, 1941. The first day of school. The trip to Marishin is quite long, but the worst thing about it is the awful mud from the incessant rain. My shoes are in terrible shape. They are beginning to go, but any repair is out of the question. Yet he's unwilling to give up going to school. And he writes, Sunday, April 27th, 1941. I suppose I'll soon have to rush to school barefoot. Leaving the isolated ghetto was impossible. In those moments when students were learning science, poetry, history, they were, to some extent, uplifted from the morbid existence of the ghetto. As educators, this is an opportunity to discuss with our students the significance of education. I went to school for a short while, and then they just uh, they closed all the schools and everybody had to go to work. So they sent me to a place that was making carpets, which was a Tapija resort. It consisted, we had like a frame with uh, some kind of a cotton going through and we used to get pieces of material and make long like long pieces of material and we used to weave it in and make designs they really came out quite nice the germans established jewish councils in every ghetto and these generally came to be known as the judenlot the members of the Judenrat were faced with many dilemmas in their decision-making process. On the one hand, they were frequently threatened with death if they did not comply with German orders. On the other hand, they tried to do what they could for the ghetto population. The head of the Judenrat in Ghetto Ludz was Chaim Rumkowski, and he thought that the best way for the ghetto residents to get through the war was to work. And eventually, over 100 factories were set up in the ghetto, providing essential goods for the Germans. All the Jews in the ghetto were forced to work by the Germans, including all children over the age of 10. Beginning in the winter of 1942, the Germans deported Jews from the ghettos to extermination camps. Saturday, September 5th, 1942. My mother has been caught and I doubt very much that anything will save her. In September of 1942, the Germans rounded up the Jews in a horrific, bloody operation known as the Sperra. They moved from house to house, forcibly removing the elderly, the sick, and children under the age of 10. More than 15,000 Jews were deported to the Chamanor extermination camp. Not a single family was left untouched. Saturday, September 5th, 1942. My poor mother, who always feared everything, yet invariably continued to believe in God, spoke to us about her fate. She kind of admitted that I was right when I told her that she had given up her life by lending and giving away provisions, but she admitted it with such a bitter smile that I could see she didn't regret her conduct at all, and, although she loved her life so greatly, 
For her, there are values even more important than life. She kissed each one of us goodbye, took a bag with her bread and a few potatoes that I forced on her, and left quickly to her horrible fate. I couldn't muster the willpower to look through the window after her or to cry. I thought my heart was breaking. It didn't break, though, and it let me eat, think, speak, and go to sleep. Well, David's diary reveals the shards of his fractured life. Moments of spirituality emerge from his descriptions. Even the fact that he continues writing a diary in a world of chaos and death reveals his choice and determination to maintain his humanity. One would expect that in the face of constant and rapid deterioration and deprivation, people would become indifferent to one another. But even the very last sentences in David's diary reveal that caring, friendship, and humanity still existed in the ghetto. Thursday, April 15th, 1943. Mrs. Deutsch came to see me today. I think she is the most devoted friend I have in the ghetto, or anywhere else for that matter. Three months later, David died. He was not even 18 years old. As educators, it's important to discuss the difficulties of life in the ghetto. However, we should not forget to teach about the strength, the human spirit, that can teach us of the struggle for life in the ghetto itself and inspire us today as human beings. Avrami Kopolovich was 11 years old when he was incarcerated in the ghetto with his parents. While in the ghetto, Avrami wrote poems in his exercise book. When I grow up and reach the age of 20, I'll set out to see the enchanting world. I'll take a seat in a bird with a motor I'll rise and soar high into space. I'll fly, sail, hover over the lonely faraway world. I'll soar over rivers and oceans. Skyward shall I ascend and blossom. A cloud, my sister. The wind, my brother. Avramik's poem expresses his freedom of spirit, his ability to dream and hope for a future in a world that denied his present. In August of 1944, he was sent with his family to Auschwitz-Birkenau. After the war, his father Mendel, the only one survivor from the family, had returned home. He found his son's notebook, where he left it before they were taken to the death camp. Ultimately, when the Germans embarked on the annihilation of the Jewish nation, they began liquidating the ghettos and deporting most of the Jews who remained in them. The vast majority of Jews deported from the ghettos were murdered. By the end of the war, all of the ghettos had been liquidated, except one in Budapest. We have touched upon the stories of David, Eva, Avramik, and Alice. Each one of them has a unique story, but their stories echo the story of more than 204,000 Jews that were incarcerated behind the walls of the Lodge Ghetto. The Lodge Ghetto has a unique story. Nevertheless, it reflects the story of hundreds of thousands of innocent Jews that were incarcerated in ghettos during the horrible years of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm.